Alright, so last weekend I was able to see a uh, theatrical re-release for one or two nights only of uh, Sunset Boulevard, which kind of gave me the idea to just go ahead and do uh, this one with its obvious opponent of sorts, uh, which is All About Eve. And uh, not just because they both kind of center around these similar central characters, not in the way they're portrayed by any means, but... Uh, in setup, these uh, similar characters who are actresses long past their prime, uh, who are d d not only are portrayed in different ways, but deal with things in very different ways, and their uh, past careers and what their future or potential lack thereof uh, holds. Um, but both of them also came out in the same year, 1950, and were quite competitive at the Oscars that year, both also not only nominated the actresses, but also in Best Picture, with obviously All About Eve coming out victorious there, but um, it seems like Sunset Boulevard seems to, have, seems to have gotten much more of the attention as time has gone on, so um, I figure we'll go ahead and start with it, since it seems, seems to more or less, as far as history goes, be the movie that's bigger these days. And to start off with, it's you kind of know immediately what kind of portrayal of the Hollywood lifestyle you're going to get, just by the way Wilder shows us the title before anything else, which is, um, we don't see it on the street sign, we don't see it in like big lights or anything like that, um, we, in no like particularly fancy font or anything, no, we see where it is spray painted on the curb the dirty ass just bottom of this curb um where the streets are usually written but that's not particularly where you would look when you would look for this particular street name um knowing the type of territory it's supposedly exploring this movie um and obviously it starts off with this kind of despite what it's actually about it has very much this noir feel, um, comp complete with being one of the biggest, oldest, prime examples of narration from the grave, beginning with this incredible shot of William Holden floating dead uh, in the pool. But the thing about it was, this is like one of our very opening shots, and the way he actually, the camera seems to be looking up and then through the water where we can see all like the cops and the news and the flashing lights and all that, apparently is a shot that's impossible to achieve because cameras cannot see that clearly through water. So I guess it was this big elaborate thing the cinematographer had to come up with where it was like reflected off of a mirror. Um, and it's to, to have a shot that's, that's the camera see, doing a seemingly impossible thing um, is where we're starting. And that in itself tells you the craft craftsmanship behind this movie uh bef just as we're walking into it and so going on that um what's really interesting it's an interesting way to look at this movie is the fact that once again it's not quite what exactly you would expect just based on what it's about and the title and all that other stuff because a lot of the first 25 minutes or so here kind of feels like the setup to a horror movie and not even like um a particularly big horror movie but like the b movie haunted house kind of stuff where we have um like just the whole gothic look in general and then stuff like when the first time we see her kind of shrouded behind whatever's left of this mansion or like the hallways with like the candles reflecting off the walls and shit um, and, uh, Eric von Sternheim as the butler that just kind of really adds this whole very sinister thing to it. You got him playing the organ and all that other stuff. Um, there's the whole, there's the ambiguous at the start line where we don't really know anything yet because Joe has obviously just walked into this scene and since we're with him and we see things from his point of view and he, his narration hasn't quite told us everything yet. Um, we just hear this contextless line if you need help with the coffin, just let me know, um, as he ascends the stairs. And we realize that the coffin is for this ape, um, and, and we see its corpse laid out, but there's this, she's treating it like it's a child's funeral, 
and it's like this really weird thing. You would, you would think you walked into... This is how B-horror movies begin. Um, it's like whatever it goes from here. Um, but then, once we get into that, um, there's this kind of contrast because Joe's narration, as he's discovering things at the same time that we are, it takes what looks like some gothic B-horror movie, and his, in, like... Um, in visuals, but as far as audio with his narration going, it's almost immediately becomes like a black comedy almost. Um, with just some of his line deliveries also, like uh, when the actual coffin shows up and he describes it as just for comedy relief, the real guy with the real coffin showed up. Um, and it just really has this interesting feel to have both of those, and it's this really weird and disorienting but also really engrossing quality to it that adds all that um and as you and as you go on there's also um like that narration is like really the strength of holden's performance like he's not he has a lot to do and he portrays it you know well enough that we are able to just keep going with it without breaking out of it and his we don't really question his decisions too much because of how just naturally he kind of falls into place as these weird things happen and get weirder as they go. Um, but the real strength of his performance is in this narration and the way, like I said, he more or less kind of brings a black comedy sort of vibe to it, uh, seemingly effortlessly. And it's um, it was really nice uh, seeing it in the theater with a surprising amount of people in there. I kind of thought it would be a bit bare bones, but um, quite a few people did show up. And it's really interesting, you don't really... I hadn't really thought about how many laughs are in this movie until I watched it with um, a slightly big group of people, but there's probably a lot more than you're remembering if it's not a movie you watch particularly regularly. Um, so there is that. So, going on that, obviously we have to talk about what Gloria Swanson's doing. And this is one of those roles where you can imagine maybe it's, you know, autobiographical, and maybe this is, you know her real self kind of coming out in a big way possible, but to my understanding, and research tells me that that wasn't the case at all. This is like pure acting, and this was more like, she was basically playing it as, this is what I could have been, um, but ultimately didn't, and so it's like, instead of kind of looking back at the past and kind of playing on those fears, or playing on a fear of the future, um, she's just kind of playing on this fictitious like, alternate universe version of herself, as opposed to a lot of this coming from an actual real place. And, yeah, it, it's real, it's, like, way over the top, uh, <laughs> to the point that it's, like, I'm really surprised people still take to it today, but there's a number of reasons for that. There's the whole, um, one thing that just comes to mind immediately is, obviously, with the way Norma Desmond's life goes, she's still obviously constantly in this mindset that she's, like, acting, like, acting with a capital A, but, like, not just on a movie set, but, like, this is just how she lives her life now, because it's almost like it's all she knows. And on top of the fact that it's obviously going to be big, because, and this obviously goes into her very, very famous line, like, one of the most famous lines in movie history, one of two that are in this movie itself, um where she says, I'm big, and it's the pictures that got small, and it's, that perfectly encapu encapsulates this particular, I guess, motivation, if you want to call it that, um, to where it's like, she's, because she's of the silent era, but obviously, since they didn't have the recorded dialogue, which can really convey emotion by itself in regards to how it's delivered, um, silent actors and actresses had to be, like, really exaggerated to get the point across, because only every so now, every now and then they have the card that would say what they were saying, but for the most part they had to just do it through their exaggerated expression, and it's like she's still kind of stuck in that as she goes through her normal life. Um, and it's well, normal, if you can call it that. And it's almost kind of shocking to know her as long as we do before we learn that she's only 50, because she seems and act, kind of looks ancient and really old. But the thing about it is, um, that's obviously, surely, the whole thing that's even... not I guess not as bad, but still being talked about today, to where it's like, if an actress passes a certain age group, then it's like, she's seen as like 
untouchably old and like everybody has to be younger so it's like it's almost like it's intentionally exaggerated her appearance to where when you learn that she's 50 you're shocked that she's not like 30 years older um and they portray that in an interesting way because it does kind of seem like yeah somewhat in her appearance especially when we see her getting all of her makeovers when she thinks she's gonna be doing another movie um but just the her demeanor and attitude just in general um, with Joe, as, as the more time she spends with him throughout the movie, the kind of younger she seems to become, like just in attitude alone, um, is really interesting to watch and um, how that kind of comes through. But then there's also uh, her relationship with Max, Eric Von Schreim's character, the, the butler, um, which apparently he was dismissive of later in life, um, despite the fact that it was, I mean, obviously he's still kind of playing something that's not quite different to him because it's there's a lot of him in it, at least as far as where the character's coming from, like in regards to a director that did once direct Dolores Watson and a director that once again is kind of past the time he knew, past that silent era that he was, you know, really big with, like uh, a, a number of silent movies. Foolish Wives is the one that really always stood out to me. Um, but then there's also the... he, he Once he got into um, acting in movies with sound, there was kind of that he was put in, he was kind of typecast in those stereotypically, like, German-type roles, like Nazis and stuff like that, like Grand Illusion, for example. Um, I really like the, the, I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but I've just kind of always noticed it, where when I think of Von Strowman, one of the first things I always think about is him wearing a monocle, which he doesn't in this. Um, but it's, back especially in his silent days, it was kind of a look that you just kind of associated with him and there's like that one shot in this movie where he's like holding up a glass to the light and the way the glass reflects off his eye kind of looks like it's like one monocle on one eye so I, I've never known if that's intentional or not but I kind of hope that it is um, and one of the things to watch here is what exactly the how much Max's devotion to her kind of progresses what's going on and kind of explains indirectly what's going on like, I've heard the argument that, um, like, for one of the reasons it's really easy to buy how over the top Gloria Swanson is to buy her as a real person is looking at her through Max's point of view and his devotion to her. It's hard to say love, but it's definitely a devotion for sure. Um, down to the whole even writing the fake fan letters to her, which I heard was Von Stroheim's idea, which is ingenious. <laughs> um, but the thing here also is we do have that stuff to where it's like, it is, you could look at it in ways like that, but then there's also this stuff that comes out, like I said, the real life stuff, to where it's refreshing to know that Swanson wasn't just bringing out, you know, her inner feelings and his performance, that it's just, like, totally coming from a place she had to conjure herself. Um, but then we get these really surreal scenes, like um, Von Strahm and Swanson watching the movie that they made together, that I believe, like, if it went unfinished uh, through its existence. Um, but they're watching this footage that he actually directed her in, which is... Well, he's watching from the projector, she's watching it with Joe, technically, but still. Um, there's just this really surreal thing of them watching their real movie and the roles that they're playing that just really is something that probably could not have had as much of an impact as it does if not for that kind of real-life thing that... Usually I feel like movies can show a strength by going off of stuff like that, but here, it's because it's more of like an undertone, uh, where like you have to know that that's, you know, an actual movie she made with Von Strahan for it to have that kind of impact. Um, so it's not like right in your face about it, that you have to like have done research and know that for that scene to be as impactful as it is with that and the kind of underlying it. But then um, there's also the way that he kind of starts to grow a common ground with Joe, which probably could have been a bit more explored, but um, does have some very interesting moments, the way they're, like, their scenes together, there's something kind of compelling there, and we're not sure if it's strictly that particular connotation that they have with each other um, that's doing it, but there's also um, some, some stuff used visually, like um, the scene where she's playing cards, and we have Max and Joe in the foreground, and she's playing cards with them in the background and there's that one shot where it's the two of them and you we can see her between them um and it's always like that i always felt like there was something there kind of conveying that she's kind of this common ground between them as the movie goes on um which is 
for the most part, nice to them, but I do think they could have delved into it more. Max and Joe kind of needed more scenes together, kind of just the two of them. Um, like, it's, it's, it's the scene outside um, DeMille's studio really works well, too, so there's that. Um, or the stage. But um, then we also have um, just the way Wilder kind of approached this. When I, before and after um, it played in the theater, Ben Magwith did the intro and outro for Turn of Classic Movies, and he was he told this anecdote about uh, how Louis B. Mayer had to confront Wilder at like one of the premieres, because he was so livid about how the industry was portrayed, and how his industry was portrayed, more or less, in this really kind of dark fashion, in this really biting way. Um, and which basically ended with Wilder telling him to go fuck himself. That like that might actually be a legit quote. Um, like whether it's go fuck yourself or fuck you, it's some it's something to that extent, almost verbatim, um, to my understanding. But yeah, it's when you watch it, you do kind of have to think where it's like, especially in this time period, and where Wilder was in his career, where he wasn't quite, he hadn't quite made. Um, as many of the gigantic things he would eventually go on to make within that decade and beyond. But there's also, um, you, you, like, you have to have a real confidence, um, to kind of tear into the industry as much as he did, um, in such a way that just felt so fearless and just so, like, before he even literally said it to Louis B. Mayer, it was, like, kind of this, you know, cinematic fuck you to, like, the whole industry, more or less. Um, but, yeah, there is that, and, and on top of that, there's also the use of, like, like, it's one thing that they use the people's real names, like, you watch these other movies where it's like, they want to be, they want to go after the industry, um, but they don't quite have the balls to go all the way, so it's like, people have names that are similar to people in the industry, to where it's like, we can pretty much tell, uh, sort of like, um, Michael Sarah's portrayal of Tobey Maguire in Molly's Game, but it's like, this movie says the names, but not only do they say the names, some people just flat out play themselves, like Cecil B. DeMille or Hedda Hopper, um, and it's like, that just adds a, adds a whole other layer where it's like, it, it really shows that he was just going as much as he possibly could for that, for lack of a better word, that giant fuck you to the industry, um, that ended up really working in all ways, where it, it actually did get to people like Louis B. Mayer, but also told this great story that is still standing the test of time in the industry as it is now. Um, but, um, and yeah, there are moments where, like, and, and not just, you know, DeMille and Hopper, but there's also um, that card game I was talking about with, um, it's Buster King, H.B. Warner, and um, Anna Q. Nelson, who were actually kind of also, like, it, like, it, you actually had to go to those actors and tell them you would be sitting at this table of people who are more or less useless to the industry now because the silent era is gone. H.P. Warner's an interesting choice because he did end up going on to get um, an Oscar nomination for the 1937 version of Lost Horizon, so it didn't, it's not like, you know, sound killed him or anything, but still, it's, he was definitely big in that era, so there is that. Um, just this, and it's, once again, the word that keeps coming to mind is just surreal, the details in this movie with stuff like that, um, and the fact that it's willing just to go for it like that, and when you're listening to Joe's dialogue and when they're talking, like, they're having the meetings and all that, there are cases where it's kind of like, I could totally see someone thinking the dialogue almost seems like it's trying a bit too hard to be sort of clever, and it seems, it seems almost full of itself, um, to the point that it almost seems like it's parody of snappy dialogue. But the thing is, is, like, the I think the reason my mind goes there is because oftentimes when dialogue like this is so, like, used to the point that it's it seems like it's trying too hard is because the movies, like, would have this kind of dialogue that are trying too hard. That trying I'm talking about is them trying to be Sunset Boulevard, and that's why. So there's always that kind of negative connotation with um, movies that kind of started something that became a trend, where it's like, when you go back to that movie, it does feel like everything feels almost like it's really played out, or like a cliche at some point, but you forget to give credit where credit's due to the movies that started that, because it's... There's a reason that started in the first place, and that's because... Movies like this did it to perfection, and people just kind of thought they could be this, thought they could be Wilder, 
and it, it, it doesn't always work. It kind of rarely does, actually. Um, so, yeah, and there are moments where um, it's not as strong in other cases. Pretty much any time they're outside of the mansion, um, it's not quite... Like, this is why I kind of don't completely, you know, go crazy for Holden's performance, unless it's the narration or the stuff inside. Every now and then he's got a nice delivery, like, um, when he's talking to the guys that are going to repossess his car at the beginning, and just the way he says the line, like, you say the cutest things, just to, like, egg the guy on. Um, but for the most part, stuff like, um, she did score an Oscar nomination, but the Nancy Olsen scenes aren't as strong. They do feel more like just to, they're there just to push Norma Desmond. They're there just to push the central character. It, they don't really kind of stand on their own very much. Um, you can tell they're just kind of there to drive the story. Same thing with, um, the character of Artie, uh, the Jack Webb character that's like his best friend. Um, they're not bad scenes. They're not necessarily boring scenes, but they're definitely not as engaging uh, or as attention-grabbing as the stuff in the mansion. And it's kind of like, when the mansion stuff isn't happening, when the Norma Desmond scenes aren't happening, um, it's their absence is very apparent. Um, so that kind of shows you the lack of strength um, those other scenes kind of have that don't have her or Max in them. Uh, with Joe working off them, too. I don't want to completely take Holden out of this, but... Um, so, yeah, there is that. And, of course, we're working towards um, our unforgettable climax. Once again, lines that are going down in movie history. Um, I do love the... If, it, if This movie would have a strong ending if it weren't... Even if it didn't end with one of the most famous quotes in movie history. Like, that scene of him, his body being taken out of the pool and then taken away in, like, the body bag, and he's talking about... His narration is kind of coming to a close as he's basically getting the last laugh, saying that the headlines are going to bring her down and show her for what she really is. Um, but then we think about the fact that she's probably not going to see those headlines, depending on how just how far back she's locked up. Like, how deep in a hole she's locked up. Um, so we get this gigantic scene where she thinks... DeMille is making a movie about her, and Max gets to direct her one more time. Uh, and it's this really huge thing, and then it also kind of brings in, and like I said, not, doesn't just end on one of the most famous quotes of all time, but also in shots. Um, but this shot also kind of went right into Wilder's next big masterpiece, um, where it's like, we see this completely insane murderous just taking her last step into her descent into insanity. Um, and it's these news cameras that she's getting right up in on. It's through the lens of the news cameras or the last shot of this movie as we're watching her do this. And that takes us right into Ace in the Hole um, and its portrayal of the media. So it's like, that could not have been a more perfect segue. <laughs> um, and then as as we talked about, Wilder's career just kind of kept going. Obviously, he'd already had, you know like The Lost Weekend and stuff like that. He still had The Apartment in his future. He still had Some Like It Hot in his future. Um, just a number of things. And so, yeah. It never it never quite... I, I completely understand it, is what I'm trying to say. It's never quite always hit me in as big of a way as the impact it's had on the industry. Um, but it's definitely a movie that's very easy, easy to appreciate those things and definitely recognize those things as they happen on screen. So, um, yeah, it's like, it's not a movie I'm always rushing to watch again, but, um, it's definitely, um, holds its place here. And like I said, even if you aren't that big on it, you can certainly identify those things as you watch it, which is just as important, really. So, especially when it holds this much of a place in movie history. So, Yeah. And going on to All About Eve, which uh, started out as, what was it, like a short story in Cosmopolitan or something in like 46, I think, um, called The Wisdom of Eve. And then after that, it was a radio production. And then eventually Hollywood said, maybe we should make this, um, despite, once again, what it kind of says about itself in a certain way. Um, and also on that, it does start in a similar way as Sunset Boulevard. We are once again starting at the end with a narrator telling us what's going on, which, um, with, as we watch, we kind of get the story of Eve before we really get the story of Eve just by watching their faces, uh, knowing that she's about to accept this award. And the interesting thing they do here is it seems like it sets up quite nicely that Addison DeWitt might be our 
complete and total point of view throughout the movie, the way his narration just kind of brings us in immediately. But they actually set up this really kind of nice ensemble thing where they av they avoid what we could have done. Like, we could have done the Rashomon thing again, uh, where we saw the different the same things from the different points of view. But it seems like with this narration, we're very kind of fluidly getting this... We're getting the multiple points of view, but the story is still moving constantly. Uh, and we're never staying in one place, but we're still kind of getting a taste of where everybody was coming from and what they were thinking um, with everything that goes on. So I did really like and it also kind of gives it much more of like an ensemble vibe, which is really kind of an important, important to this movie, despite the fact that it seems like maybe Eve might be the focal point or Margaret might be the focal point. But um, yeah, the way we just get a taste of pretty much everybody with that kind of style really works well and really works in its favor. Um, and of course, when we start, we have, if there's, if there's one thing that I'm not totally sure works about uh, Anne Baxter's performance. It's the fact of uh, how quickly we see through it, um, as the birds are really loud. Um, they're Anne Baxter fans and they're mad at me. So, um, But the thing here is that it's obviously we kind of get that vibe from the opening scene, but then we almost immediately meet another character that just instantly sees through her bullshit in Thelma Ritter. Um, and it's... Um, when we watch this scene, it's sort of like, I, I feel like we never quite see, the the feigned innocence I feel like maybe should be a tad more believable, so we know exactly, so it's more believable that people are fooled by her, even though we they do eventually see through her pretty much everybody. Um, but it does give us some interesting um, outlooks on these opening scenes, like the way when we're watching her tell her story, the one that Thelma Ritter immediately tries to shut down, um, it's it's interesting to watch it as, like, this is not only her trying to prove herself to Margo in a direct way to say, like, oh, this is my sob story, please take me in, but it's also her performing for Margo, and it's, and I, I always kind of like that almost little bit of irony where, um, Margaret's defense to Thelma Ritter saying that is like, um, not every life experience takes place on the vaudeville stage or whatever. Um, and it's like, it's, <laughs> but it, it, we know as an audience that she's definitely watching a performance right now. So I do kind of like the irony that that's Margot's particular defense of it. Um, but yeah, going on that, and also we, let's, let us all thank All About Eve, by the way, while we're on the topic. Um, to where this kind of seemed to really be the setting off point for Thelma Ritter's career. She ended up, including All About Eve, she ended up getting four, <laughs> four consecutive Best Supporting Actress nominations over the next four years, and then two more in the next decade. Um, and she's just easily like one of the all-time great supporting actresses, no matter how small her part is, she always made that impact. I strongly, I cannot strongly enough recommend Pick Up on South Street if you want to see what Ellen Ritter can really do. Um, but going back to what Ann Baxter's doing here, um, I did always, it, I mean, it is nice that even though I don't feel like the innocence comes through in a way that we can totally see what other people see when they're blinded, but there's also the whole, we can like, because we know this, we can constantly see the darkness in our eyes, and that's something that Baxter does really well. Um, but I have just always wondered what it would be like if they were a bit more, if it was like a bit more ambiguous about Eve's intentions. And we weren't really sure for a while, but obviously we're sure right away. But I suppose it is better to more or less be straight to the point about that so that we have time to focus on all the other things that are going on on all the other characters. And it kind of gives the movie a certain foundation that everything goes on, so we're not... Yeah I, I, yeah, I guess that's not really the point, um, so that's not in, that's not incredibly valid coming from me, but I do think that, um, I, I would just be interested to see a version of this movie that went in that direction, to see how it went, but, uh, yeah, but then there's, um, but yeah, obviously she also plays it well enough that, um, it's so, it's obviously a credit to her, but on top of everybody, everybody else, that, um, it's become so satisfying when we watch her get her ass handed to her multiple times. Um, not, the least of which was what Thelma Ritter was doing. Then we have, like, um, obviously Addison DeWay calls her out a couple times. There's the big scene towards the end that is fantastic when um, 
when she tells, I, I love, there's obviously the more famous lines like, um, I'm nobody's fool, least of all yours. But the moment I love the most in that scene is when she goes to the door and opens it and says, get out. And just the way he arrogantly walks over and says, you're too small for that gesture and just closes the door <laughs> is amazing. George Sanders is amazing in this, but, um, I'll go more into that in a little bit. But there's also, um, the famous scene when she tries to seduce Bill, uh, away from Margo and he does the whole, um... Oh God, what is his line? And what I go after, I want to go after, um, which is just really good. And um, it's yeah, I. If for, and there's one more thing about Amy's performance before we move on. It, if there's one thing that I'm not totally sure, I kind of go back and forth on my opinion of. It's the decision the Magnus made to not show her performance. Um, overall, I do think that was a good idea, and it makes it very effective. And it's kind of this. Not only is it just left to our imagination, but also just the way the story's told. Um, there's, it's, it's not even necessary that we need to see that. Um, but then once again, it does almost make you wonder. It's like it almost would have been another level of ballsy to actually get Ann Baxter to attempt to show um, her basically what propels her above Mario Channing for what would essentially be the rest of her career, or whatever that is. But. Um, yeah, so, that, so there's that, but on top of, um, going on to Margot Channing now, Betty Davis, obviously, in her, I would say, easily most famous performance. Um, what's interesting about this, in regards to Gloria Swanson's performance, is that, obviously, there's definitely much more of a realism in regards to Betty Davis's portrayal, because we were talking about how Gloria Swanson had to basically conjure up something that was kind of foreign to her, that she didn't actually feel necessarily. Whereas we can tell um, Betty Davis is coming from a real place, for sure. Um, and while I thought that was an asset uh, in Swanson's performance, um, to not go in that direction, it's just as much of an asset for Davis to go in that direction, because they're, just com because they're coming from so many different places, yet they somehow kind of have to... Obviously, one's going to be a lot more over-the-top and theatrical, um, but once again, you know, from the silent era, so there's a difference there to begin with. And with All About Eve, obviously, it's more... Um, yeah, you could say stage acting has to be big, too, because you got to play to the back and all that, but um, even so, um, there is just something really kind of grounded here. Even when she's being, like, over-the-top, um, we can just see it as, like, you know, this realistic excess uh, in regards to that lifestyle that she lives. Um, and one thing she really does well is this whole, the way she's done in by her own ego, to where, like, when, you know, Eve comes in and she's doing this obviously bullshit story, it's like, the thing that brings Margo down is the ego that basically says, well, yeah, of course somebody would feel this way about me because I'm Margo Channing. And just going along with that is pretty much what ends up being her downfall. Um, and she makes it believable that there is, while still being this, you know, realistic human being, um, that there is that much ego inside this person. Um, but not, not in a way that, like, shows off too much, but it shows off just enough, is what it does. Uh, which is the kind of perfect balance that she was able to find. Um... And then, of course, the really famous scene where we're watching her fall apart at the party um, is... It starts off, and she's the one saying, you know, like, fasten your piece of seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy night, but then she's the one that has, like, the bumpiest of nights of the, of the whole place. Um, so, yeah. And then, also, um, a line that always struck me that she says is when she's talking about b being 40 and how it's like really bringing her down and how like, you know, Bill's 32, he'll always look 32. Um, but here it's like, she has that line where when she admit she says when she admits her age, she feels like she's taken all of her clothes off. Which I always thought was a very interesting line and more like, I'm, I'm not sure if it's like intentional irony or what it's exactly trying to say because when we're listening to DeWitt's narration in the opening scene, um, one of the very first things he says about Margot's introduction is that, um, she was in a show, she was in a play for A Midsummer Night's Dream as a child, and shocked everybody by going on stage naked, and he follows that up with, and she's been a star ever since. And so it's like, she kind of started her career like that, but then basically aging and coming down from that, um, she also feels like she has her clothes off, 
which is, like I said, I'm not quite sure if there's any, supposed to be any connotation there, um, or what, but, um, I've always kind of taken it as this, I guess, bit of irony is what it would be, so, um, yeah, that's just a line that's always struck me when it has that, you know, callback to, uh, DeWitt's narration, intentional or not. Um, and so, talking about DeWitt now, because we keep coming back to him, you'll realize he's, like, kind of the the one steady thing here as we do an ensemble. Um, what's amazing about what George Sanders does here in his Oscar-winning role, so incredibly deservedly, um, is the fact that he's so unpredictable in regards to who he's gonna screw over, I guess you could say. That might be a bit of a surface-level way of putting it, but he doesn't seem to, as long as it interests him, it doesn't really matter who's gonna be harmed by it in the meantime. Uh, whether it be the people we're rooting for, or the people we're not rooting for, um, and I always think that made him a really interesting character, and just the fact that in this world, um, the perspective that this is given to is the character of the critic, <laughs> um, which just says everything in itself. Um, but, the, and there's also those moments, like, you, you get it throughout the whole movie, and like I said, the big scene, especially at the end with Eve, but one scene of his that always really stood out to me was when they're at the party and they're sitting on the stairs, um, and it's like, whenever he speaks, it's almost like the rest of the movie around him just stops and everyone just watches and listens to him. Um, and it's, it's just this really great moment, I've always thought. Um, and then there's, um... Yeah, I just didn't, I don't have anything else to say, I don't think, but, um, yeah, I was gonna say that he's easily one of, uh, probably the best wins in the best supporting actor category we've ever had. Um, so, and he's one that's not, like, mentioned with many of the greats, but, um, the, the people that know, they know. All, All About Eve has, like, a really, really passionate fan base. Uh, they're definitely out there, so they, they understand, if nobody else. Um, and then, of course, you know, speaking of the stairs scene, there's Marilyn Monroe just coming in for, like, 30 seconds, but, like, very much making her presence known with just a couple of lines, like, either one with the sable and the gable and all that. Um, I think the Asphalt Jungle was the same year where she had also, um, had drawn attention to herself, but, um, yeah, this was definitely one where you were really taken to it. I think she's even, like, featured on some posters, even if she's there for, like, 30 seconds. That's how much of an impact she made. Um... So, yeah, so basically, what you, in regards to comparing it to Sunset Boulevard, there's this really... The interesting thing about it is that Sunset Boulevard had this way of, like, Norman Desmond's portrayal and her depiction and all this. Um, there's, and as we see, like, it, there's something unique about how we watch her descend into madness. But the thing about it is that um, it, it's, it's very movie-like. You know, like there's, def it definitely is an entire world, despite the fact that we see so much of real Hollywood reflected on it. Um, the story itself and the way it's told feels very much like it's inside a movie. Um, whereas when we see the um, depiction in All About Eve of a similar, obviously there's the stage and there's the screen, but, and All About Eve is the stage, but here we basically have. It's like, it's, it seems like this very real depiction, not just in Betty Davis' performance, but the portrayal of everything else, has this kind of grounded way about it to where it feels like, it's this, it feels very real in how it depicts what is hap what did happen in this industry, what is happening in this industry, and what will continue to happen in this industry, as we see in the final scene where Eve basically comes full circle on herself, um, and, and finds an Eve for herself. So, um, it's not, so yeah, there's, and it's expressed through, you know, that biting dialogue and all that, um, but it's, and it's, you know, there's also the character motivations and all that stuff, but it does feel very much like this is the kind of stuff that we just kind of see, like, and I was talking about, you know, it seemed weird that Norman Desmond seems so old and she's only 50. It's like, we see Margaret Channing kind of go, starting to go off this cliff, and she's like a decade younger. <laughs> um, and it's just really, yeah, so it really takes this big, you know, cynical approach to all that. Some people think that, um, like, the irony and the cynicism in Sunset Boulevard is what makes it more relevant than All About Eve, but I think the people that say that forget just how much there is in All About Eve, so, um... 
Yeah, there is that. If there's every now and then, there's some problems in all about Eve. I think. I think. I think the middle portion there, when she's starting to kind of realize what direction Eve is going and what her, you know, fiance thinks is just paranoia at the start. Um, that that kind of gets. There's kind of a repetitiveness in the middle of the movie there, um, but it does eventually, you know, find its way to keep going, and it's it's very much another thing that it does so well is it's very much melodrama like on its surface um but the way about that is it's so it's so meticulous about itself and it really kind of like the big acting isn't you know it's like i like i keep saying it's grounded enough to where it doesn't feel like it's that they have to do that to get the drama across um there it's it's all there in the dialogue and the motivations and these performances that never go to into too much and still feel like real characters in this industry so um and it's like like if everyone felt too cartoonish then we might have a problem and it might seem a bit more yeah, not as clever um but that's definitely it's all these things working together and it does still you know feel so dark and all that and like i said there's a there's some cynicism in it for sure um, that final shot, you know, almost feels like the last shot of a thriller, uh, <laughs> where it's like, I think even the music goes significantly darker, so, um, yeah, there is that. So, of course, um, both of these, in the same year, against each other, um, just annihilated the Oscars. There was, um, I think All About Eve got, uh, 14 nominations, which obviously is record-setting. Um, the, th the th interesting thing is we had... Um, one in each category in Sunset Boulevard with William Holden, and Gloria Swanson, Eric Von Strahm, and Nancy Olson, and then in All About Eve we had um, Thumb and and Celeste Holm in Sporting Actress. I forgot to mention Celeste Holm, which um, she's got that very... This is also kind of, you know, Baxter's as well, but um, the way that uh, Celeste Holm is the really sweet one and is like, you know, Eve's biggest cheerleader, um, and then the way she believably come, becomes so jaded throughout the movie, it's almost kind of heartbreaking to watch where, where she starts off and where she ends up because of what he has done, and she does that very well. Obviously, George Sanders um, in Supporting Actor and Ann Baxter and Betty Davis, of course, against each other in um, Actress. Um, and that is nine nominations in the 20 slots in the acting categories. These two movies alone are almost half of the acting nominations that year. And George Sanders is the only one that went away with it. Um, obviously, Best Actress went to uh, Judy Holly for Born Yesterday, which is one of my favorite performances ever. I know this is probably going to be controversial, especially with that passionate All About Eve fan base, who kind of believe in the whole vote-splitting thing with her and ba with Davis and Baxter. But um, no, I very much stand by... Um, Judy Holiday's win for Born Yesterday, but um, if I talk about how much I love Born Yesterday, we're gonna be here all day, so I can't do that <laughs> yet anyway, but, um, so yeah, um, I would say I probably prefer All About Eve. Sunset Boulevard is easier to watch multiple times, um, but All About Eve does kind of have, it almost, with how real it feels, and it's able to tell a similar story, but with all these different characters, um, and just how biting the dialogue is, um, which, once again, Sunset Boulevard was full of, as we talked about, but there's almost a somewhat... Sunset Boulevard is great, but there's almost a bit of silliness to it, if you watch All About Eve close by, um, which I may also get in trouble for saying, but that's that's how I feel. But, yeah, I mean, I, I would obviously probably take a Wilder movie over a Magowitz movie um, more often than not, but um, in this particular case, I do think it wasn't completely out of the realm to give All About Eve Best Picture over Sunset Boulevard. Once again, leaving my love for Born Yesterday out of this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's where we can leave this. So, um, I already have one plan for next week. It's going to be a, one of the movies is going to be brand new. It came out last year and I just missed it. Um, and then, yeah, we've got Solo and all that other stuff coming. So... Uh, Fahrenheit 451, all that stuff. So, yeah, until all that, I think we're done.